So this figure shows basically what you saw in the animation um, of how translation happens. Of course the two subunits only come together um, when they are going to be translating an mRNA. Um, and you see the assembly of the initiation complex here which just means the small subunit of the ribosome, the large subunit of the ribosome, and the tRNA plus the mRNA all together. That gets the whole process initiated. The things that you need for protein synthesis, you need amino acids, you need tRNAs. There are about 42 different tRNAs. Um, and you need 42 different amino acyl tRNA synthetases because these are the enzymes that attach the amino acid, the correct amino acid to the correct tRNA. You do need ATP because this is an energy requiring process building proteins. And of course you need the mRNA that carries the codons. Then you need, here it shows again the tRNA carrying the methionine. That's the very first amino acid that's going to be added. So you need this tRNA carrying methionine. Of course you need tRNAs carrying all kinds of amino acids, but to get things started you have the first one. And these are just the two subunits of the ribosome. The 30S subunit is the small subunit and the 50S subunit come together. And then the initiation complex uh, factors are just proteins that help with the whole process. The 70S initiation complex is just the two parts of the ribosome hooked together. Um, charged tRNAs just means tRNAs that are carrying their correct amino acids. So if a tRNA is carrying an amino acid it's called charged. If it's not carrying an amino acid it's called uncharged. Elongation factors are again just proteins that help with the process. GTP provides energy just like ATP. And so those are your basic um, requirements for uh, translation. In bacteria, there's something interesting that can happen. Transcription and translation can be coupled, which means it can happen at, uh, simultaneously or at the same time. Because there's no processing of the mRNA. The mRNA in bacteria doesn't have a cap, it doesn't have a tail, and it doesn't have introns. So even before transcription is finished, so we continue to add nucleotides to the three prime end of this strand, once the 5' prime end of the mRNA starts to hang, sort of hang down away from the DNA, the ribosomes can actually load on and start translating the protein. So you can actually have transcription still going on even, even when translation gets started. But that's not possible in eukaryotes because in eukaryotes the RNA would have to be processed first, adding the 5' prime cap, adding the 3' prime poly A tail, and splicing out the introns. And then it has to leave the nucleus before it can be translated. So, but the basic process of translation is the same in eukaryotes. There's a few differences. Prokaryotes have polycystronic transcripts. A cistron means a gene, so a polycystronic transcript means one mRNA that carries the instructions for making more than one protein. So you could have um, one mRNA that has, here's the one mRNA that has the start codon and the stop codon for making one kind of protein here. And then a little bit down here you could have another start codon and another stop codon, instructions for making a second protein, and so on. You could have multiple instructions for making multiple proteins within one mRNA molecule that would be a polycystronic transcript or polycystronic mRNA. That's only possible in, in bacterial cells. In eukaryotes, one mRNA can only carry instructions for making one protein. Another difference is that the eukaryotic mRNAs last longer in the cell than the prokaryotic mRNAs. Therefore, they can produce, by translation, more protein product. Um, because the eukaryotic mRNAs um, can last longer hours compared to minutes for bacteria. So that's another little bit of a difference in terms of translation. 
After the protein is made at the ribosome, it will fold, of course. The, the ribosome builds the primary structure of the protein, but then the secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures will form after that. And other things can be added or trimmed off of the protein. So we call these things post-translational, meaning after translation, post-translational modification of proteins. One thing that's typically added to proteins is phosphate groups. We call that phosphorylation. It usually happens on amino acids called tyrosine. Um, that sometimes will cause the protein to be in an inactive form. And then later those phosphate groups can be removed and that can activate the protein again. So it's a way of regulating proteins by adding phosphate groups. Uh, one type of post-translational modification that you're pretty familiar with is the attachment of carbohydrates. That requires an enzyme called glycosyl transferase. Glycosyl referring to sugar or carbohydrate chains and transferase meaning attaching something to or transferring something to. So attaching a carbohydrate to a protein creates a glycoprotein. That's going to happen in usually in the rough ER. Additional cleavage of the protein or trimming of the protein could include removal of signal sequences, which we'll talk about in the next lecture segment, but also trimming off of the first methionine amino acid or residue. Residue just means amino acid. So that first amino acid, which is always methionine, is often trimmed off shortly once the protein is completed. Cleavage of zymogens, which are enzymes which have to be cut before they're activated, and so on. Um, another post-translational modification of proteins is that most, uh, most enzymes in a lot of proteins have to complex with metal ions, such as magnesium or iron. Uh, for example, hemoglobin has to have an iron in its uh, porphyrin ring structure. Um, Chlorophyll, um, that's not strictly a protein, but let's see. Most of your enzymes have to complex with magnesium in order to function correctly. If you don't get enough magnesium, or you don't get enough iron, or you don't get um, some of the other metal ions in your diet, then you can um, have enzymes that aren't able to function correctly. All right, chaperones, sometimes called chaperonin proteins. These proteins are inside the cells and they're actually used for folding other proteins. And this picture shows the top view here. You can see sort of this hole in the middle and this is the side view. And there's actually, I think, a little cap on, across the top. And believe it or not, proteins can partially fold on their own, but then sometimes they have to go into the chaperone complex and these components actually move and then a folded protein comes out. And we, a lot of research is happening as to what exactly goes on inside the chaperone because any kind of protein can go in and get folded in its own correct way. They're not specific the way that enzymes are specific for their substrates. Chaperones will fold any kind of protein in their correct folding in their correct way. So they're really interesting, um, but we don't know exactly how they work. Um, there are several kinds of antibiotics that will block translation in bacteria. There are also things that block translation in eukaryotes, but we use these as antibiotics to treat infection because they block um, bacterial translation and it's one way to kill a bacterial cell is to block translation or block ribosome function. So these are some that your book lists and most of you are probably familiar with these um, to some extent but what you might not know is that they the reason they work is that they block bacterial ribosome function. And then I asked this question considering what you know about endosymbiont hypothesis endosymbiont hypothesis says that bacteria um, that um, mitochondria and chloroplasts are um, evolved from bacteria that became symbiotically related or um, that are entered into a symbiotic relationship with a eukaryotic cell. 
So considering the endosymbiont hypothesis, what effect would these antibiotics have on mitochondrial ribosomes? And the answer is that they should block the function of the mitochondrial ribosome because mitochondrial ribosomes are very similar to um, prokaryotic ribosomes. Luckily, the, when you take these drugs, they're not able to get into your cells. They can't cross the plasma membrane of the, of the animal cells. So luckily, they can't get into your mitochondria.